Shall we start with the next slide? Ileya Taiba U Mahoba. And that means good evening and welcome in Maltese. And we would like to welcome you all as you come in on behalf of Root and Branch Do It Yourself. We're very pleased to welcome you to our first gathering of 2023. It's wonderful to see so many of our root and branches here. A particularly warm welcome to everyone joining us for the first time. And to those of you who've got up early or stayed up very late to be with us. Do it yourself is very much about social action and social justice. And this is very much at the heart of our talk this evening. At Root and Branch, we work to keep the gospel and Jesus' teachings at the heart of what we do. We seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit to help us as we work to make the Catholic Church safe, just, and inclusive for all. We're delighted that Archbishop Charles de Cluna readily accepted our invitation to explore what a church truly founded on the Beatitude looks, Beatitudes looks like and to share his thoughts about how we can bring about this authentic and far-reaching change. One thing we are sure of is there is no room in a beatitudinal church for abuse of power in any shape or form. We are privileged that Archbishop Charles is with us as he is at the forefront of action to tackle crimes of sexual and other forms of violence in the church. We are very conscious of the impact that engaging with our event this evening may have on any survivors of clerical abuse who are with us. We know that previous talks resulted in some survivors seeking support and some disclosing their abuse for the first time. We acknowledge that your experience of the church is anything but beatitudinal. And for that, we are deeply sorry. Please make care of yourself your first priority and consider leaving the talk if that is best for you. Your well-being is our first concern this evening. Our time together is being recorded for posting on our website. We know that you will be mindful and respectful and consider the impact that your contributions might have on others. If you are sharing information that is not in the public domain, please do think twice and be careful not to name others. Some of us may prefer to keep our identity private, so please do give yourself a different name and or turn off your camera. We've asked Archbishop Charles to speak for 45 minutes, and then there will be around 40 minutes for questions. So we now start our session with this prayer. Loving God, we know that we have much work to do to heal the hurt and damage caused to your people as we realize the extent of abuse within the church. We are deeply sorry for all the ways in which our church has failed to reflect your endless love for us. We come to you as pilgrims on our journey to make the church safe, inclusive and just. We know that in making the church safe, we are doing your will and that a safe church is a gift from you. A safe church is a beatitudinal church. Your son, Jesus, showed us the way to live in truth, humility, peace, and love. He taught us to respect and value each and every person made in your image. He warned us against causing even one of these little ones to lose his faith in you. Help us to recognize your Holy Spirit who lives within each one of us. Give us the courage and determination to listen with compassion and hope and hope to everyone amongst us who has been abused in your church. Help us to move forward in solidarity to bring about your kingdom where truth, justice, reconciliation and peace flourish. Let's take 
a few seconds to feel the importance and the significance of this moment as we come together as people of God from all parts of the church and all over the world. Archbishop Charles, we'd like to take a few moments to pray for you. We give prayerful thanks that Archbishop Charles de Cluna is with us today. We thank you for his courage and dedication and determination to challenge injustice in the Catholic Church. Holy Spirit, we ask you to stay close to Charles and inspire his work to bring about justice and to instill in his own words commitment responsibility, accountability and transparency of the church's leadership. Uh, and so dear spirit, help us to open our hearts and minds to the messages that Charles shares with us this evening. Be with the spirit and keep us all safe as we continue on our journey towards a safe, just and inclusive church. Hi, my name is Brian Devlin and I'm a part of Root and Branch. It's my great privilege to introduce Archbishop Charles Shukluna to this Root and Branch webinar. This is our most heavily subscribed webinar since Root and Branch was formed and it speaks of the importance of this occasion. The temptation in making an introduction like this is to run through the speaker's curriculum vitae and I've read it and it's long and impressive, but I thought that given we've got a number of hundreds of people from all over the world attending tonight, I reckon that most people, most of you know precisely who Archbishop Charles Shukluna is. So instead I wanted to share a few, very few words with you about why I'm so proud and pleased that he's joined us today. The Irish writer Maeve Binchy described herself as a collapsed Catholic. And it's a phrase I often use to describe myself too. I struggle with certainty. I'm frequently collapsed. And that struggle is not helped when we see a church that seems to have fallen from its path. Many of us are hanging on by our fingernails and hoping, praying that our collapse is not terminal. Daily we read, of more and more anguish brought about by the abuse of power, and it collapses us all over again. It's sort of like the well that us Catholics have drunk from has become somewhat poisoned. But then, then we see and hear the prophetic people and the prophetic voices, the voices that remind us that amidst all of that pain is also hope and honour and Christ's love. And Charles Shukluna's voice is one that stands out for me and for countless Catholics across the world. Speaking on the topic of the quest for truth in sexual abuse cases, Archbishop Shukluna said, I quote, a deadly culture of silence or omerta is in itself wrong and unjust. Other enemies of the truth are the deliberate denial of known facts and the misplaced concern that the good name of the institution should somehow enjoy absolute priority to the detriment of legitimate disclosure of crime. That sums up for me the importance of where we are in seeking a beatitudinal church. Archbishop Shikluna is adjunct secretary of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in the Holy See and is known to be a fearless pursuer of truth and justice for victims of sexual abuse not just in words, but in action. Archbishop, we need you to remind us that we are to be a Beatitudinal Church. We've met before. It was a day of great grace, peace and joy for me 
when you visited, visited me here in my home on the Black Isle in the Scottish Highlands as part of your investigation into the predation of my abuser, father, later Cardinal Keith O'Brien. Archbishop Charles, you taught me more than you will ever realise that day. You are in great measure the reason I am still a Catholic, although sometimes a collapsed one. But I'm still here, and with these people I'm working for better things, still hanging on. Archbishop Charles, thank you for being here too. Over to you. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me for this moment of sharing and reflection. And thank you so much for making me reflect on the Beatitudes as a roadmap for the church. I'm, I feel that the choice of the title, the Beatitudinal Church, uh, we dream of and look forward to is such a happy phrase. And I'm going to base my reflections um, on two main sources, which I feel are authoritative and also very clear and very inspiring. My first source is the teaching of Pope Francis on the Beatitudes in the reflections he offered in his document on the call to holiness from 2018, from 19 March of that year. Gaudete et exultate. Be happy and rejoice and exult. And in this beautiful document on holiness, Pope Francis gives a brief meditation on the eighth Beatitudes. And I'm going to use this as a sort of frame and work for uh, my meditation. But another source um, of profound reflection on the Beatitudes, which I'm going to refer to, is also the writings of uh, the now the late Benedict the Sixteenth in his book Jesus of Nazareth. As you know, he published as Pope, but as Ra Joseph Ratzinger, three books, which were a synthesis of his reflections, his studies on the figure and, and the great, um, you know, master who is Jesus of Nazareth for each and every one of us. And in this first book, which goes from the baptism to the transfiguration, um, Benedict offers an extraordinary reflection on the Beatitudes. And I'm going to link uh, the two um, reflections from Pope Francis and Pope Benedict, um, as then I move on uh, to suggest some concrete aspects inspired by each and every uh, one of the eight Beatitudes. Because if we're talking about the Beatitudinal Church, we need to take the Beatitudes as they are presented in the Gospel of Matthew. There is also um, a shorter version in the Gospel as, of Luke, as you know. Um, but the classical point of reference for the Beatitudes are the eight Beatitudes in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, Francis, the Pope, calls the Beatitudes a Christian's identity card. In the Beatitudes, he says, we find a portrait of the master, which we are called to reflect in our daily lives. So when we, we call the church a beatitudinal church, what we're actually meaning is a church that is true to its vocation, to be the presence of Jesus in today's world, to, to be a living witness to the choices, and the style of the master. The Beatitudes, the Pope says, are in no way trite or undemanding, quite the opposite. We only practice them if the Holy Spirit fills us with his power, frees us from our weakness, our selfishness, our complacency, our pride. And so thank you very much for starting this meeting with prayer. Because at the end of the day, uh, the first beatitude 
that is blessed are the poor in spirit teaches us to rely on the fatherhood of God in whatever we do. Benedict the 16th has this to say about the Beatitudes and the church. I find this reflection um, extraordinary and very poignant and very, very um, relevant to our discourse, our, our subject matter today. The Beatitudes, say, um, Ratzinger says, display the mystery of Christ himself. And they call us into communion with him. But precisely because of their hidden Christological character, the Beatitudes are also a roadmap for the church. How, how beautiful. The Beatitudes are a roadmap for the church, which recognizes in them the model of what she herself should be. There are directions for discipleship. Directions that concern every individual, even though according to the variety of callings, they do so differently for each person. Now, I refer to the fact that we started with a prayer and even if you uh, sort of use the phrase, do it yourself when, we, when you refer to root and branch, um, I understand that this is an invitation to be proactive in the life of the church. That is, don't expect other people to do something that you have been called by divine providence and even by your own hurts and your experience to do. But it's not really something that invites us to do it ourselves, that is without reference to God or the community. That's not how I understand your catchphrase, do it yourself. And this is what the first beatitude teaches us. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. The gospel invites us, Francis teaches us, to, to peer into the depths of our heart, to see where we find our security in life. Once we think we are rich, we can become self-satisfied that we have no room for God's word, for the love of our brothers and sisters, for the enjoyment of the most important things in life. The Lord enters a pure heart with his perennial newness. And Ignatius of Loyola, you don't expect Pope Francis to quote Ignatius of Loyola, um, talks about spiritual poverty in terms of holy indifference. You do your duty, you do your bit, and that is something that nobody else can do. You have to do it yourself, but then you have to rely on the mysterious and ineffable power of God. And this is what Benedict says when he offers the commentary on this first beatitude, blessed are the poor. The church as a whole must never forget that she has to remain recognizably the community of God's poor. Just as the Old Testament opened itself to God's poor to renewal in the new covenant, so to any renewal of the church can be set in motion only to those who keep alive in themselves the same resolute humility, the same goodness, that is always ready to serve. And I think this is something that we need to bring to um, with us from the first beatitude, quoting Pope Benedict, that any renewal of the church, and we're talking about renewal of the church, we're talking about church that needs constantly to be reformed. The renewal of the church will be set in motion only through those who are truly poor, poor in spirit, who keep alive in themselves the same resolute humility, the same goodness that is always ready to serve. The second beatitude 
is blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Now I would like to do a bit of commentary here because uh, when you read Francis and you read Benedict, you realize that there is a mix up with the numbers, with the order of the Beatitudes. And even Francis himself recognizes that there is a mix up here with, it, with the, the second and the third Beatitude because some ancient manuscripts of the Gospel of Matthew put number two as number three and number three as number two. So uh, if you read, for example, Francis, you get blessed are the meek as number two, whereas Benedict would put, um, following other manuscripts, um, <laughs> the meek as number three. So uh, this is simply um, a side comment. Uh, so not to be confused when you go back, because I would really encourage you to go to these sources I'm quoting, the commentary in France by Francis in Gaudete Exultate, but also the beautiful, profound and theologically uh, extraordinary um, uh, commentary on the Beatitudes in, in Benedict or Joseph Ratzinger's book, Jesus of Nazareth. Now, when Francis talks about blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth, he, he quotes Therese of Lisieux. And this is something that uh, may be a moot point for us because we obviously look at our leadership, look at the church, look at each other with such an idealism that we don't really have much patience for the um, weakness of others. But Therese of Lisieux, as quoted by Francis, says, perfect charity consists in putting up with others' mistakes and not being scandalized by their faults. What does this mean? Because there are other beatitudes that tell us that we need to thirst and hunger for justice. So this is not saying, well, we can't do anything about it. We have to love each other and, and not seek for justice. I don't think that that is the meaning of the meekness that is recommended and commended in the second or third uh, beatitude, blessed are the meek. But Francis talks about meekness as a style of correction, an expression of interior poverty and humility. I find the reflections offered by Benedict um, very, very much appropriate to our subject matter because he takes um, the theological concept of being meek, um, going to the Greek and the Hebrew and Awim, and links it to the beatitude of those who are poor in spirit. And so he quotes Moses and, and Jesus, and also the king of peace in Zechariah, the one that is also quoted in the liturgy for Palm Sunday. Through his obedience, this king of peace, the meek king of peace who rides on a donkey, doesn't ride on a stallion, the arrogance of worldly power, of vanity. Through his obedience, the king of peace calls us into his peace and plants it in us. The word meek belongs on one hand to the vocabulary of the people of God, to the Israel that in Christ has come to span the whole world. Why does Benedict say so? Because the blessing of the meek, the beatitude, blessed are the meek, is linked to the inheritance of the land. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the land. And according to the beautiful reflection of Benedict, the land is a space for obedience a realm of openness to God that was to be freed from the abominations of idolatry. Conquerors, and let's say, instead of conquerors, let's put leaders. And when I, when I quote Benedict, you understand why I'm, I'm say, saying of conquerors, I say leaders. Because we, at times we're scandalized by certain leaders. Conquerors come and go. But the ones who remain are the simple, the humble, who cultivate the land and continue sowing and harvesting in the midst of sorrows and joy. The humble, the simple, outlast the violent, 
even from a purely historical point of view. And so this blessedness of the meek is of those who work against the current, are not scandalized by the arrogance, the haughtiness, and the dysfunction or cynicism of the conquerors of certain vain leaders, even in our communities, but inherit the land, which is a place of freedom. When it has this beautiful link between the promise of the land, which for Israel was the promised land, was also a place for freedom of worship, the place to be free in our relationship with God. The third beatitude is something that we need to um, meditate on um, profoundly, because I think that this third beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, is very appropriate for our subject matter today. The worldly person, according to Francis, averts his gaze. This is what even the, uh, the priests and, and the Levites do in the parable of the good Samaritan. They're coming down from Jerusalem to Jericho. They see a person in need, but they avert their gaze. They move on. But people who mourn are those who think to sue things, according to Francis, as they are. They have the ability to sympathize with pain and sorrow. And they are unafraid to share in the sufferings of others. They are not unafraid to, they do not flee from painful situations. They sense, this is a beautiful quote from Francis, which he has also developed beautifully, actually in the same year, 2018, in his letter to the people of God. In May 2018, Pope Francis wrote a letter to the people of Chile. But in August 2018, then he wrote a letter to the people of God about the response of the Catholic Church to situations of abuse of power. He mentioned spiritual, physical, sexual, and also the, the curse and scourge of clericalism. But people who are blessed with this beatitude of blessed are those who mourn, according to Francis, are those who sense that the other is flesh of our flesh, who are not afraid to draw near, even to teach their, touch their wounds. They feel compassion for others in such a way that all distance vanishes. In fact, Benedict, talks about this sort of uh, mourning when he distinguishes between two kinds of mourning. There is a mourning, he says, of those who have lost hope. And such loss of hope eats away and destroys man from within. But there is a mourning of which the church is, I would say, in, in dire need. There is a mourning occasioned by shattering the shattering encounter with truth that leads to undergo conversion and resist evil. Pardon? These are people, according to Benedict, who do not run with the pack, who refuse to collude with the injustice that has become endemic but who suffer under it, even though it is not in their power to change the overall situation, they still counter the dominion of evil to the passive resistance of the suffering, to the mourning that sets bounds to the power of evil. And in fact, he quotes also the beautiful example of Mary, mother of Jesus, who under the cross, is with a small group of people. And Benedict says, we encounter here a small group of people who remain true in a world full of cruelty and cynicism, 
or else with fearful conformity. They cannot avert the disaster, but by suffering with the one condemned, by their compassion in the etymological sense, they place themselves on his side. And by the loving with, they are on the side of God, who is love. So the third beatitude, blessed are those who move, we're actually being invited to be near those who suffer, those who are wounded, those who are either survivors or even victims of abuse in the church. This is also being a beatitudinal church. The fourth is also very important and appropriate for our discourse today, because it is the blessedness of those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The promise of this beatitude is that they will be filled. And the Pope, Pope Francis says, those who desire justice and yearn for righteousness, experience an intense feeling that involve basic needs and our instinct for survival. And that's why Francis has this profound, very quick reflection on the fact that this beatitude talks about hunger and thirst for justice. It's not any attitude. It's not any sort of epidemic, very light sort of wish for justice. Francis insists that being in hunger and in thirst for justice corresponds to an experience of such an intense feeling that it is linked to the very survival of the individual and of the community. And we need to pray for this beatitude on the church, that the spirit may fill each and everyone with this hunger, with this thirst for justice. Because this is a beatitude which corresponds in its very, very vivid description of this attitude to what is a survival instinct. Because that is what hunger and thirst leads us to, to survival. And so people who have this blessedness, this beatitude at heart, do not suffer injustice, but give up, do not give up fighting for real justice. However, the Pope says, and this is also a very important comment by Francis, true justice comes about in people's lives when they themselves are just in their decisions, in their attitudes, and it is expressed in their pursuit of justice for the poor and the weak. So anybody of us who is in advocacy for victims, for the poor, for the vulnerable, is living this important beatitude. Blessed are those for hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. According to Benedict, this beatitude is concerned with those who are on the lookout, who are in search of something great, of true justice, of the true good. The people this beatitude describes are those who are not content with things as they are, how important are these words by Benedict? Whenever we feel that we cannot be content with things as they are, we are already participating in this blessedness of the fourth beatitude. The people this beatitude describes are those who are not content with things as they are and refuse to stifle the restlessness of heart that points man towards something greater and so sets him on the inward journey to reach it. The people meant here are those whose interior sensitivity 
enables them to see and hear the subtle signs that God sends into the world to break the dictatorship of convention. And then, of course, Benedict, in his usual style, quotes the examples of Zachariah and Elizabeth, Mary and Joseph, Simeon and Anna, the 12 apostles and Paul. It would be interesting to read the reflections um, that illustrate what uh, Benedict is saying. On this group of people, the people who hunger for thirst and righteousness and are not content with things as they are. The fifth beatitude is blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. And uh, Francis distinguishes this attitude of mercy uh, in two um, in two levels. First, the level of giving, helping, serving others. Mercy as an expression of the deeds of mercy. But also forgiveness and understanding. And he insists that in the Gospel of Luke, the invitation to perfection, to be like God, is summarized in the invitation to be merciful. Be merciful even as your father is merciful. All of us have been looked upon with divine compassion. And I think this is a very important aspect. A beatitudinal church is born out of this conviction that every one of us has been called to mercy and through mercy, we all have been called by mercy. And we are also being called to be an expression of the Lord's mercy. Should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Benedict it does not give a commentary on this beatitude, blessed are the merciful, but the rest of the beatitude. There's only a couple of words where he says, I will do a commentary on this beatitude when I give my own reflections on the parable of the Good Samaritan. So when you're reading the beautiful section in Jesus of Nazareth by Benedict on the Beatitudes, you will not find any reflection on this beatitude, the fifth one, blessed are the merciful, because you have to look um, at other pages, pages 197 onwards, where Benedict then takes the parable of the Good Samaritan. But this is where uh, our group needs to understand why Benedict chooses the parable of the Good Samaritan as the best commentary he can offer on the fifth beatitude, Blessed are the merciful. And he says, the Samaritan, the foreigner, makes himself the neighbor and shows me that I have to learn to be a neighbor deep within and that I already have the in myself. I have the answer in myself. I have to become like someone in love someone whose heart is open to being shaken up by another's need, then I find my neighbor, or better, then I am found by him. And so I would like to greet all people who are defending survivors, who are in advocacy for survivors, who wish the church to be a better and safe place, they are the Good Samaritan. They are those who have found in themselves this call to become neighbors, to learn to be a neighbor deep within, and that already we have the answer in ourselves. Benedict says the great theme of love, which is the real thrust of the text of the parable of the Good Samaritan, 
is only now given its full breath, for now we realize that we are all alienated in need of redemption. We are all that man forsaken by the road. Now we realize that we are all in need of the gift of God's redeeming love ourselves, so that we too can become lovers in our turn. Now we realize that we always need God who makes himself our neighbor so that we can become neighbors. And this links, of obviously, the, the, the attitude of being merciful to the fundamental and first beatitude of poverty in spirit. We realize that we need God's help. We need his redemption. And uh, Benedict quotes a number of fathers of the church that took the beautiful image of the Good Samaritan, this foreigner coming from a foreign land, as the image of Jesus Christ, finding humanity wounded, naked on the wayside, and giving humanity redemption, dignity, and trusting it to a community, to the inn and the innkeeper, and saying, I will repay you when I come back. This is obviously what he will tell us if we commit ourselves to be neighbors to people who, either in the church or in society, are left on the wayside because they have been abused, they have been wounded, they have been humiliated, they have been abandoned. The sixth beatitude is blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. And Francis says, this beatitude speaks of those whose hearts are simple, pure and undefiled. For a heart capable of love admits nothing that might harm, weaken or endanger that love. Nothing stained by falsehood has any real worth in the Lord's eyes. And so, the exhortation that Francis gives us and the church as he meditates on this purity of heart is that we commit ourselves to serve our brothers and sisters from the heart, from a pure heart. This is obviously totally, totally different from the spirit Whereas we use either priesthood or leadership as some sort of platform for haughtiness, arrogance, diktat, the purity heart is a totally different language, the language of the meekness of the love of God. Benedict insists on the word heart. The heart, he says, the wholeness of man or woman, must be pure, interiorly open and free in order for man to be able to see God. Why? Because the beatitude goes, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Inquiring after God, seeking his face, that is the first and fundamental condition for the ascent that leads to the encounter with God. Even before that, however, the psalm specifies that clean hand and pure heart entail man's refusal to deceive or commit perjury. This requires honesty, truthfulness, and justice towards one's fellow men and toward the community. What we call social ethics, although it actually reaches right down into the depths of the heart. So for Benedict, the purity of heart is also linked to that thirst and hunger for justice, because a pure heart requires, to quote again, Benedict, requires honesty, truthfulness and justice towards one's fellow men and toward the community. We will see God when we enter into the mind of Christ. Purification of heart occurs 
as a consequence of following Christ, of becoming one with him. The ascent of God, this is a, one of the quotes I really like from Benedict. The ascent of God to God occurs precisely in the descent of humble service, in the descent of love. For love is God's essence and is thus the power that truly purifies man and enables him to perceive God and to see him. So Benedict does not see any incompatibility between ascent to God and descent towards the washing of the feet as the Lord does in the Last Supper. For us, that is the way, the way of service is our ascent to God with a pure heart. The seventh beatitude is that that declares blessed the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Now, Francis starts from uh, a negative, negative comment, says, listen, we need this uh, beatitude because we ourselves are often a cause of conflict or at least of misunderstanding. Peacemakers truly make peace. They build peace and friendship in society. So your catchphrase, do it yourself, is now an invitation to make peace, to effect reconciliation, true justice, in truthfulness, but also with lots of patience and solidarity. I would like also to invite you to read note 73 and 24 in uh, this document on holiness by Pope Francis where he talks about detraction and calumny and the dangers of subjective interpretations. Even uh, the best of us are at times targeted by detraction, by calumny, by malicious interpretations. And so we need not only to understand that there is a price to pay when you are in a certain mission, on a certain mission, but we also need to pray for conversion from any temptation to uh, use either social media or means of communication to harm other people. However, Pope Francis does a very important um, comment, peace making, you know, peacemakers. Though. So a peace doesn't, it's, it's not something that is, is magical. You have to work for peace. Peacemaking needs also to confront um, reality as he is. Uh, Benedict insists on, on this second bit of the uh, beatitude, for they, shall be called sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And he says, the seventh beatitude thus invites us to be and do what the son does, so that we ourselves may become sons of God. And he says, only the man who is reconciled with God can also be reconciled and in harmony with himself. And only the man who is reconciled with God and with himself can establish peace around him and throughout the world. And this is something which is a very important when we talk about a mission of bringing healing to our brothers and sisters, because this is bringing peace to our brothers and sisters. Reconciliation with God, with oneself, with one's history, with one's narrative, and giving them the power to establish peace around themselves and throughout the world. The last beatitude, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, is an invitation according to Francis to, you know, not be afraid to go against the flow. He realizes with a certain degree of realism that being a Christian is going against the flow. 
challenging society and even becoming a nuisance. But this can happen also at intra and the church. We also can become a nuisance for a sense of comfort, of complacency. Unless we wish to sink into an obscure mediocrity, let us not long for an easy life. These are the words of Francis. So he's saying, listen, if you want to contribute for a better world, for a church that strives to be a better church, don't expect an easy ride. But unless we wish to sink into an obscure mediocrity, let us not long for an easy life. We cannot expect, Francis says, that everything will be easy. We may be viewed negatively, regarded with suspicion, met with ridicule. The cross remains the source of our growth and sanctification. And then Francis, with his usual, usual wise sense of discernment, says, persecution today is also done in very subtle means by slander and lies. And we know that more often than not, people are also deceived, they are slandered, they are lied about by people who should know better. Benedict links this with the second or third beatitude, blessed are those who mourn. The mourning of which the Lord speaks is non-conformity with evil. It is a way of resisting models of behavior that the individual is pressured to accept because everyone does it. The world cannot tolerate this kind of resistance. It demands confirm conformity. It considers this mourning to be an accusation directed against the members, the numbing of consciences. And so it is. That is why those who mourn suffer persecution for the sake of righteousness. And to the extent that we mourn when the church is not a safe place, then we may also be subject to the eighth blessedness, to the eighth beatitude. You asked me to offer a reflection on the synodal process that we are going through uh, I myself will be part of the um, continental pro process in Prague at the beginning of February in a few days' time. And as you know, in, in this very interesting document, which is a synthesis of the first phase, and so is, is actually a reflection of the comments, you know, um, given to uh, the Senate um, through... So, so many different um, platforms. And uh, I would like to quote uh, an important number, which actually I need to find. And number 20 speaks directly to a subject matter, it seems. An obstacle of particular rele relevance, number 20 of the uh, synodal document, the continental uh, synthesis. An obstacle of particular relevance on the part of walking together as the scandal of abuse by members of the clergy or by people holding ecclesial office. First and foremost, abuse of minors and vulnerable persons, but also abuse of other kinds, spiritual, sexual, economic, of authority, of conscience. This is an open wound that continues to inflict pain on victims and survivors, on their families and their on their communities. There was ongoing reference to the impact of the clergy sexual abuse crisis and the church's response. For many, the aftermath of this is still a powerful unresolved issue. 
there was a strong urgency to acknowledge the horror and damage and to strengthen efforts to safeguard the vulnerable, repair damage, and to the moral authority of the church and rebuild trust. Some dioceses reported that participants wished for them publicly to acknowledge and atone for past abuses. And this is a quote from the Episcopal Conference of Australia in the synthesis given to uh, the Secretariat of the Synod. Careful and painful reflection on the legacy of use has led many synod groups to call for a culture change in the church with a view to greater transparency, accountability, and co-responsibility. For me personally, to read this in the document in preparation for the Synod is a sign of hope. It's on the radar. We cannot pretend it is not there. And when you invited me to reflect on a beatitudinal church, I realized that the choice was so happy, a blessed choice. Because when you see what Jesus chooses to describe himself and his disciples, you realize how he wants us to be. And to return to what Benedict XVI said on the relevance of the Beatitudes, the Beatitudes display the mystery of Christ himself. Christ is the one who thirsts for hunger and justice. He is the meek guy. He is the poor in spirit before the Father. He is the peacemaker. He is the humble servant, merciful, kind, pure in heart. But they call us, the Beatitude call us into communion with Jesus. Precisely because of their hidden Christological character. Because they tell us something about Jesus himself. The Beatitudes are also a roadmap for the church. Which recognizes in them the model of what he, she herself should be. There are directives for discipleship. Directives that concern every individual, even though, according to the variety of callings, they do so differently for each person. And this is where you have to do it yourself. We need to do it together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Archbishop, for that. You have, uh, you've certainly covered uh, far ranging themes. We're very grateful for that. And you won't be surprised to know that in the chat, there are uh, a very wide range of questions and observations. And uh, we look forward to your responses to those. So thank you very much for that. Uh, can we start with my colleague, Mary Varley, who's going to, who, who is just, just to remind folks that the, if you want to post a question anonymously, please post it to Mary, Mary Varley, that is, whose name is in the chat. If you're less concerned about your question or observation being anonymous, then please post to everyone. And my colleague, Maggie Conway and I will do our best to pick up your, your reflections and your questions and put them to the Archbishop. Can we start with you then, Mary? Okay, um, Thanks. Archbishop Charles, this, this question is coming from someone who describes themselves as an anonymous survivor. And they say the church feels so far from beatitudinal that it's lost the trust of Catholics. And many of us are deeply ashamed of the church as more and more abuse and cover up comes to light. As a survivor, I want to ask, how can the church survive if its leaders continue to carry on treating survivors in the way that it does? Well, I don't think there is any survival available. It will survive because the Lord will be with us, but we will, we will certainly be called because we are called to do things better. That's why we're here. 
we're joining together. That's important. We are so we also need to be a sign of hope, encouragement to each other. And this is what the Pope calls this culture of clericalism, where we um, look up to the clergy and hierarchy as the only ones who determine who the church is. And that's not true. We are also the church and we are not without the hierarchy. We are as a community. We will do whatever it takes. It's also the blessedness of being poor in spirit that we will do our duty, we'll do our best. God will do the rest. But I, I understand the frustration, the shame, the anger. And, uh, and also, this should not become a poison that paralyzes us. It should be a catalyst to keep on thirsting and, and feeling that hunger for justice. I think this is this is the spiritual combat. The Pope also mentions in Gaudete de Exultate. Um, we, 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 if we paralyze by this anger, then we will not be proactive. We need to be proactive. And we, we can't do it on our own. We need to do it together. But I think that the fact that even the Senate documents are recognizing this issue is a very important point. I don't think that we can go through a synod without facing these issues, because otherwise the synod would be a simple pie in the sky. Thank you very much for that, um, Archbishop. Uh, if it's all right, I'm going to ask uh, couple of questions from the chat and I'm going to try and they're less anonymous and not anonymous and I'm going to try to to link them there is a, a question from Felix asking if in your opinion Archbishop there may be some connection between compulsory celibacy and the sexual abuse that you, you you've spoken of by the Catholic clergy um, and then there is a, 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 a perhaps a, a related question around um, uh, uh, there's a related observation, I should say, uh, from uh, Shimba, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, a question around allowing or an observation, our priests to marry, our Catholic priests to marry, like indeed our Anglican brothers and sisters. Um, and I wonder whether you have any thoughts on both those, uh, in both those areas, please. Uh -huh. uh, I need to find a quote. There it is. In number 34, for, for me, reading, and I, I really thank you for making me reread the working document for the continental stage. Because, uh, but at, in number 34, there is this phrase which personally gave me a lot of hope. And I think it also directly refers to the issues raised in these important questions. At, at the same time, the reports are sensitive because, as you know, this document is a report on the reports, okay, from the different Episcopal conferences around the world. Number 34 says, at the same time, the reports are sensitive to the loneliness and isolation of many members of the clergy who do not feel listened to, supported, and appreciated. Perhaps one of these, of the least evident voices in the reports is that of priests and bishops speaking for themselves and their door experience of walking together. A particularly attentive listening must be offered to enable ordained ministers to negotiate the many dimensions of their emotional and sexual life. I will repeat this phrase from the document of the Senate for the inter in, in continental states. A particular attentive listening must be offered to enable ordained ministers to negotiate the many dimensions of their emotional and sexual lives. This cannot remain taboo. This cannot be remain taboo. This has to be on the agenda with great humility and great realism. And I'm, I'm really, really, I'm really grateful because the, the document for, I think for the first time is recognizing 
not only the issues of loneliness in the clergy, but the fact that we all need, as we grow, you know, the seasons of life, to negotiate the many dimensions of our emotional and sexual lives. And then, of course, it says something that goes beyond the questions. The need to ensure appropriate forms of welcome and protection for the women and eventual children of priests who have broken the vow of celibacy, who are otherwise at risk of suffering serious injustice and discrimination is also noted. And so I, I think this realism is, is something that we need more of. Um, I don't think that it's, uh, it's as simple as saying, we have a celibate clergy, so we're going to have more sexual misconduct with minors, because unfortunately, I would say unfortunate, um, churches that have married clergy also have instances of sexual abuse of minors. But the, the question of loneliness, the question of unresolved negotiation of one sexual urges is an issue that cannot remain taboo. And, and this is something that the, the question then of whether we should have married clergy or not, we, we have married clergy in the Catholic Church, in the Oriental Rite. We also have married clergy in the Latin Rite through the Ordinariates, um, our brothers that came from the Anglican Communion. And our communities are, are sort of getting more and more used to having married clergy. Um, this is not something that is dogma in the church. It's, it's, it, it can be um, a question of development. I'm, I'm open to these discussions because I realize that the question of loneliness, the question of um, this negotiation of the sexual experience of, of, of priests is, is something that, you know, needs different, different um, models of a response. And I am open to these discussions. I think that's they good. are. Essential. They are. Essential. That's good to hear. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Maggie, do you have any questions? I do. Great. There, are, there are so many. Um, here's one from from John John Rosebank. So renewal only comes through those who keep resolute humility. So do you agree that it is time then for the bishops to return to their historic humble role? working with the laity in governance of the church and not assuming superiority to them. The laity played a leading role in every ecumenical council until 1868, when they were abruptly excluded. Traditional Catholicism is a true partnership of lay and clerical. Is it time to resume that path? And, and I know there have been expressions informally elsewhere that the current process, the Synova process, has felt in some way very managed, and that many, many of the laity have not really been offered a platform to really express what they feel, or that there has been a filtering and therefore a different view or the accepted Episcopal view, shall we say, has been put forward. Would like your comments on that, please. Yeah, um, I was reading a very interesting book lately by a, a Jesuit who died only recently. He was an expert on the councils, a certain Father O'Malley, who, who summarized the, the, a lifelong um, uh, expertise on the councils. He, he wrote a book on the Council of Trent. He wrote a book on the, on the Vatican Council I and also a book on Vatican Council II. And he has a little red book called When Bishops Meet. But he also talks about the councils and membership in the councils. He also comments on the memberships of lay people and in, in the councils of the first millennium up to Vatican I. Uh, they usually were the upper classes, the, the emperors, etc. They were not really the, the representatives of the laity as, as we would understand, but certainly there was a role. Um, uh, and uh, it was probably with Vatican I and Vatican II, that membership of the councils was really um, reserved only for bishops. Um, and and this, is, this is something that um, will, will probably develop in the future. I don't know whether we'll ever adopt the uh, model of the Anglican Communion, where they had the three houses, etc. 
Uh, but but yes, I understand that um, this resolute humility requires of us bishops um, a listening, a listening attitude. I think I think that there are four attitudes that Francis wishes for the church in Evangelii Gaudium. We're talking about a document issued 10 years ago now, 2013, towards the end, but, um, you know, we're in the 10th year of this important document. And Pope Francis talks about a listening church, a listening church, a church that welcomes, a church that accompanies, a church that goes out, outreach. And I think that these four attitudes of the church that Francis wishes for the church, and he is a providential pope in this regard, it needs to be adopted by us bishops as the style of our leadership. Is it a leadership that listens, that welcomes, that accompanies, that is also outreach? And I think that this synodal process is, is not an end in itself, but the process itself, you know, I'm always reminded of that famous fable by Isop of this father who had uh, an orchard and, and he's trying to persuade his kids to work the land so that the, the oranges and lemons in this orchard, um, which actually bear fruit. And he says, I have a treasure there. Why don't you go and find that everybody goes and, and starts, you know, working the, the land because they want to find the treasure. But the treasure is in the trees. They, the alert, wanted, wanted this process, you know, a hard process of tilling the land, of manuring it. Of, of, and, and, and then they realized that the treasure was all there, but they had to work together. And, and the process itself uh, was, was the treasure. And I think that this is what France is trying to do with this um, pre-synod. I mean, it's a synodal process. The synod will happen in 2023, 2024, but we're already in this process and then there is implementation. This is not magic. It's a paradigm shift that uh, would need ages to be unlearned, some negative aspects and, and to be learned. And the synodal document talks about issues concerning clergy that seem to be resisting a this openness for a church that listens, that accompanies, that welcomes, that accompanies, that goes, um, does outreach. But I think there is, th this is the, the, the way Peter is leading us through. Um, imagine Peter, faced with Cornelius on the Mediterranean Sea in Jaffa and being sort of shaken because the spirit challenges his comfort zone as a Jew and tells him, do not declare unpure, impure what I have purified. And then he is, goes to Cornelius, who has been also invited by the spirit to accept Peter. I think um, that's why... Uh, when Pope Francis talked to the, his diocese, the Diocese of Rome, about the Synod, he chose this Bible passage from Acts, the meeting of Peter and Cornelius, because that's where Peter was shaken out of his comfort zone as a Jew with the dietary laws, etc., and said, no, you have to open up outreach to the Gentiles. So he listened, he welcomed, he accompanied, and there was outreach, there was mission. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Mary, are there any more anonymous questions? Uh, I'm new, Mary. Yeah, there are two here, and Archbishop Charles, I think these relate to what you were talking to us about hunger and thirst for justice sake and the fight for justice, because we, we've two anonymous questions, both from survivors, but they're about people's individual fight in their terms for justice. So bear with me whilst I just explain a little. 
Um, one person says that they've reported the sexual harassment that they've endured in, um, in relation to um, a cleric in that district. They reported that to their bishop and the case was investigated, but the bishop has remained silent. And this person feels that they keep hurting themselves by anger. Yet, and the question is, when your own bishop is silent, that feels abusive. Um, but when your bishop is silent, where do you go? And linked to that, there's another person describing themselves as a victim of clerical child sexual abuse. And writing directly, this person, um, to you as adjunct secretary. And they're feeling that they've knocked on the Vatican door several times, but they haven't had a response. And they're wondering what, what is it about the church that's preventing a response to them? And, th and they want me to emphasize that they're saying this prayerfully and sincerely in Christ. Yeah. So two questions there about non-response. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I've been insisting for quite some time, and and, and I find that this is also, um, I think that I will keep insisting that we need to um, do something better when we come to communicating with people, especially with survivors. Now, let's start from the question of the DDF now, the congregation. I, on, on the CDF, the structure and, and what the Pope wants me to do on the, as a joint secretary is that I preside a review board which is on appeal stage, and that is my role. So I do not um, deal with the uh, daily cases that come to the DDF, but only those that are referred to this board I preside, which is an appeals board. So um, there is now um, a secretary for discipline section who is Monsignor John Joseph Kennedy, a good man from Ireland uh, who has been there for quite some time. Now he's secretary and, and he would be the person to co connect with uh, concerning individual cases. But we expect, at least I'm talking from now using the hat of the Holy See, we expect the bishop in the diocese, through the safeguarding people he has. And I hope that every diocese have a reference safeguarding commission, whether it's in the diocese, whether it's in the metropolitan sea, whether it's individual, who should also take care of the victims. This is something that the Pope legislated on in Vos Estis Lux Mundi in 2019. He said, listen guys, Every diocese needs to have an office which helps people disclose their abuse, but also supports them. And this is also something that the diocese should invest in people, especially experts, who can be liaison, liaise with these people. Now, I know that when we bishops um, do not engage with people, we complicate their lives, we create sources of frustration and anger. That is why we should always have a, a person of trust who can engage with victims and follow them on a human level and be able also to advise them. And this is something that um, should be done. When, when it comes to the Holy See, um, I would, I would suggest that people refer to the bishop. The bishop has a right to ask for information and share it. I'm personally an advocate and, and there is a book that will come out very, very soon, I hope, uh, before the end of this year, where we did a seminar in the Holy See about rights of victims in processes. And we also invited experts from different um, areas of civil law as well because we need to learn from the experience of other systems of law 
And I'm insisting that for every process, there is somebody who is responsible for the rights of the victim. This is something that needs to further development in our system. Because one of the great things that I'm noticing, that I've noticed in, on, over so many years, is that this lack of communication with victims creates a lot of suffering, sometimes undue suffering. Sometimes there are cases that have been resolved and the victim is not informed. It's not that church has not offered an adequate response, but part of the adequate response is to make the victim aware that their thirst and hunger for justice has had a response. Because otherwise, if they, they're not informed, uh, um, it, it is an issue that is still pending for them. And that is a source of great suffering. Um, Archbishop Charles, I think what the two questioners were saying is that, and what you're responding is, what should happen? What I think they're expressing is the frustration and, and helplessness about knowing who to go to and what to do when it actually doesn't happen. Yeah. Well, when, when the bishop... <laughs> You know, when the bishop um, refuses to uh, give an answer, you, you keep knocking on his door. But also, um, there is now a mechanism under Vos Estis Lux Mundi, this law, where you actually write also to the Holy See. The question is, you, your second question was, but the Holy See does not respond. And this is, this is, uh, this is, this is something that needs to be to be managed because uh, you can't leave people without an answer or somebody who can actually take care of them. And that is why we need people um, because, because there is the law, the structures are there. My point is, why are the structures that Pope Francis wanted for every diocese not in place? We would not be at, in this, in 2023, you know, Mary, we wouldn't be facing these questions if people would have followed the law done by Francis in 2019. So what else can I say? Obey the law. Follow what the Pope says. It's not that we have to invent the way. We're talking about a law that was done in 2019. Okay, COVID and all that. But... And this is where I get frustrated as well. I share in the frustration and the shame. For example, I, I'll tell you what I've done in my diocese. I mean, became Archbishop of Malta 2015. The first thing is, was I was realizing um, that the review board we had was taking too long to uh, give answers to people. And, and we had an, a new um, safeguarding commission put in. But then after 2015, 19, um, realizing that, you know, somebody also has to take the initiative, I insisted that for every case, there is an official that is responsible for taking care of the victim or victims. And it is not the investigator, it's not the judge, somebody who is going to take care of liaising with the victim and of their needs, you know. So you don't need the law to tell you, you know, these are instincts that, you know, um, and, and so, uh, and, and this is where, where groups like, like yours are very important, you know, because they create a conscience. They create a thirst and a hunger for the right thing to do. And they also are a bridge between good practices in civil jurisdictions, for example, they're not perfect, but what, what jurisdiction is perfect? I mean, after all, jurisdictions depend on the players. You may have a perfect setup, a perfect law, but if you, do, you have incompetent people trying to implement it, you, you're going to have a mess. Now, at times, I feel that we are at that, you know, in, in, in different points of the graph and, and, and in different places. And that is, uh, you know, something we need to work on. And so wh whoever can actually help with advocacy, 
uh, with, with humble engagement of people in leadership is doing the right thing. I mean, technically, if, if you go to a kind of lawyer, they may also say, let's try to denounce you. But I mean, this is not magic. It depends on denuncio. And the means whether he's interested or not, you know, because he's representing the Holy Father, he's representing the Holy See. Is he interested in advising the bishop to do the right thing or not? Depends. Okay. Right. Thank you, Archbishop Charles. Now, Maggie or Rihanna? Yeah, thank, thank, thanks very much, Mary. Thanks, Archbishop. We've, uh, we've, uh, you've stated you, you, well, you started by by referring Archbishop to Benedict's reflections about the, the beatitude, and there is some concern in the chat about the alignment between his, between Benedict's words and his actions. Specifically, has been pointed out in relation to abuse, concealment, or cover up. But if I could turn to a, a specific question now, please, from Maggie. And it's this, to what extent have the Jesuits and the Vatican fallen short of the standards they profess in fully investigating the allegations of abuse by Father Marco Rubnik? To what extent have they fallen short in responding to the atrocities that these women were subjected to over decades and in making reparation to them and the community of the faithful? The hierarchical church has been shown again, yet again, to make nothing more than empty promises. It's failed in its most sacred duty, to which in fact Archbishop you referred, its most sacred duty to live out the mission of Jesus. What is the relevance of, or indeed the need of, such a, the need for such a corrupt institution for the future? That's a big question, perhaps you could. Well, yes, I, I think the, the answer is us. I mean, if we're going to say the Jesuits and uh, the church is not the Jesuits, Jesuits are not the church. What about us? Are we all corrupt? Are you all corrupt? Is the church corrupt in us or even in this person who is obviously very upset and angry? Now, on this case, a specific case, I know as much as you know from the media. I don't have any further information more than you would have re reading what I, I've, 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 I've read. And so I'm not able to um, give comments, um, but only impressions. Impression is that, uh, that there have been failings that we people who are responsible for decisions need to face. But I will stop there and commenting on individual cases. And I would like and ask, kindly ask people not to refer and ask me my opinion on individual cases. I'm sorry, I'm not able to offer comment on individual cases. But um, I would not accept the fact that I'm making the church corrupt or that you guys who are part of this are going to, are part of a corrupt church. There is corruption in the church, but doesn't mean that we are all corrupt. And I think that we should have the humility and the wisdom to distinguish and not to say that we are all corrupt because some of us are. Thank you. Thank you for that, Archbishop. Maggie, have you got some more questions? Y yes, I do. <laughs> They're all rather there are large a lot of questions. questions. Um, there are two here. One is, is from Julia and one is from Sue, but they are related. So they're particularly interested in, on what your opinion is on how Petrine and Marian principles support a beatitudinal church, that's the first. And the second is, how can the church support the refusal to ordain half the world's population, the female half? There is less and less um, support for, or even traction, for the argument that, well, Jesus only chose men, because we know now, and in fact, the scholarly community has known for some time, and our archaeology has also shown us that indeed there were many prominent women involved in the early Jesus movement. From about 300 AD, things began to change. The stories, what was written, what was found, it began to change. So just, just your thoughts about those two issues about how the principles, the theological principles, the Marian, the Petrine, how they relate 
to the Beatitudes that we've just discussed? And how is that right in denying the ministry and the calling of half the world's population? And we know that they were involved at the beginning. Yeah. I, my, my simple answer to this uh, very complicated question, which uh, goes beyond my competence because I'm not the Pope, is that, is that um, we tend to distinguish and we need to distinguish between leadership and presiding at the Eucharist. Women has all, have always had a leadership role in the church. The problem is, the question is, and this is something that the church of the East and the West need to answer one day, probably not in our lifetime, did any woman preside at the Eucharist and say, this is my body, this is my blood. Because otherwise, we have had women as leadership from the very beginning. Mary Madeline was chosen by Jesus to be the first herald of the resurrection. And in fact, Pope Francis insisting that in her memorial, which is now a feast for the whole church, we celebrate the fact that she is the apostle of the apostles. Now we know that uh, St. John Paul II um, defined this and the Pope Francis has repeated this and I will not enter the, in the theological discussion, but I think what we need to distinguish is between leadership and priesthood. Because the unfortunate thing that happened after Vatican I is that we almost instinctively taught that in order to be a leadership in the church, a leader in the church, you need to be a priest. It's not true. In the Middle Ages, there were nuns who were in charge of monasteries. If you, if you take, for example, the model of a monastery founded by Bridget of Sweden, the founders of the Bridgetings, that had what they called potestas dominativa, the abbess had authority over the clerics, the nuns, the whole community. This was leadership. Mm -hmm. But she did not consecrate the bread and the wine and say, this is my body, this is my blood. Okay, so there is a sacramental role, which is different from the question of leadership. And leadership is servant leadership, and it's open to everybody. And I think that this is something we need to engage more even in our synodal processes on a diocesan level. I ask myself, how many women are my collaborators, for example, in a diocese? Is it an all male when, when there's no need? Because there is a wisdom which comes from opening up this question of welcoming, of listening to all the community, which, which is a source of wonderful insights and wonderful wisdom. And so that is my take. And so I know that I don't have a, a clear and direct answer, yes or no, but please let us distinguish between leadership in the church and consecration of the bread and the wine, saying, this is my body, this is my blood. There are two different things. You don't need to be a priest to be a leader in the church. You don't need to be a bishop to be a leader in the church. Thank you. I mean. You're right, there's so much we could discuss. I mean, there are findings, I think, where Cherulia was actually identified as a bishop uh, found in the catacombs in Naples. So there is definitely more discussion to be had there. And I suppose it would be, a, and I'm, I'm heartened by what you say about leadership, but we are also struck. I don't believe there's any woman that leads any of the departments within the Vatican. Um, or am I wrong? I don't think so. There are under secretaries, but I don't believe there are any that head. Not yet. Okay. But maybe that's a plan. Right. Not, Thank not you. Thank I you. think that Francis is on record with having done a lot in, in these 10 years. It was a low be bar. <laughs> it was a low beginning. <laughs> okay. Thanks. We're going to be, we've only got sadly another four or five minutes for <gasps> questions. There are an awful lot of questions. We're going to do something with them. We have, I think, one at the moment, but. Um, my colleagues yeah, and I will talk about what we do. Yeah, Mary. Yeah, I think uh, probably that we're almost on our time for last question. 
Um, we are. There's one here that I'd like to move us on to. I'll turn to you then, Mary. Thank you. Okay. It's your turn anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this is about living a life of the Beatitudes. And this person saying that living a life of the Beatitudes is to live with a spirit of sacramentality and a spirit that opens to us the sacredness that's at the heart of all. As a church, we've lost our way because we've abandoned a spirit of sacramentality. And um, the person's asking, would you speak to that, please, Archbishop Charles? Now, I, I, I want to understand exactly what this spirit of sacramentality mm -hmm. means, because, of course, as you know, if you even if you read uh, Lumen Gentium and Sacrosanctum Concilium, the church is called the sacrament of the unity. You know? So sacrament is actually a sign, but also an, an effective instrument in God, of God's grace. And as we said, and, and this is something that uh, actually brings us to the opening remarks by Francis himself. And uh, let me find them. I'll, I'll quote them again because I think that they respond to this important observation where Francis says, the Beatitudes are in no way trite or undemanding, quite the opposite. We only practice them if the Holy Spirit fills us with his power, so we become a beatitudinal church to the extent that we are docile, open to the grace of the Spirit. To the extent, that is, that the Holy Spirit frees us from our weakness, our selfishness, our complacency, our pride. So to a certain extent, the fundamental uh, beatitude of this poverty in spirit is an openness to the spirit. So a, a response to what uh, Francis called the temptation of Pelagianism. That is, we will do it through our own merit, through our own steam. The wrong uh, meaning of do it yourself or let's do it ourselves. No, we can't do it ourselves. We need the sacrament, which is the grace of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are the seven sacraments, and if we're talking about reconciliation, we know that baptism, reconciliation, penance, and the anointment of the sick are sacraments of reconciliation. But there is also the, the sacraments of the Spirit, you know, baptism itself, the confirmation. But there is also the two sacraments that build the community, sacred orders and marriage. To a certain extent, if you see also the model adopted by the Catechism of the Catholic Church in 1990, um, the, the sacraments give life to the church. This is the, the teaching, the beautiful teaching of uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium of Vatican Council II. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, restrict the interpretation of the Beatitudes simply to sacramentology or to cult or to worship. But if we're talking, to quote Francis, that we can only practice the Beatitudes if the Holy Spirit fills us with his power, then the means of this grace are the sacraments, the sacraments of the church, especially the Eucharist, especially the Eucharist. I think the Eucharist is the summit of the life of the church because it, 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 the Eucharist is Jesus himself and the Beatitudes are, are an, a portrait of Jesus. What are the Beatitudes? He calls people blessed, but he is the first one to be meek, to be humble, to pour, pour in spirit, a peacemaker, who hungers for justice and truth. 
who thirsts for righteousness. He is the one who is persecuted, the one who, who, is, who shows mercy. He is the Lord. And being a beatitudinal church means being more and more like Jesus through the help of the sacraments, but also the word of God. Thank you. We've come, unfortunately, to the end of our questions and answers, but um, Archbishop, with your permission, uh, in fact, there, the suggestion is made at several points in the chat. We will send the uh, chat to you. Obviously, we'll, we'll redact full names, etc. Um, mm -hmm. And we would very much look forward to your response when, you, when you've got a moment to 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 do just that and we can share your responses there are a lot of questions so, you know, um may take you a little time but we can share your responses with our community thank you i think i'm handing over back to mary now am i mary um, oh brian brian hi uh, um archbishop shaklina i'm i'm amazed at uh, your ability to grasp these challenges and this discussion the way that you have. I shouldn't be amazed because you're the man to do it and you're the man with the courage to come and, and talk to us. I believe there's been two discussions going on today and you can see the difference between the, the real pastoral concerns that people have and the theological reflection that we've had. And my job here is, is simply and honestly to thank you and, and how can we thank you? I believe that this has been a grace-filled and challenging series of encounters and, and all across the world, your voice has been heard tonight and it's been a powerful voice. And people are sitting in their rooms at their desks or in their armchairs and are reflecting on this encounter and they will reflect on it for many months and years to come. Um, when, when I was listening to you I was thinking of the words of the poet Mary Oliver. I don't know if you know her work, but uh, Mary Oliver is a very famous American poet. And what came into my mind was this little couple of lines when she was talking about the end of life. And this is what she said. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. None of us are merely called to visitors and you most definitely are not merely a visitor. You make a lasting beatitude no difference to our church and to our world. And you've given a group like Root and Branch and all of the the, the groups across the world, um, a badge that we're a sign of hope and that we need to work um, together to create a beatitudinal work. So I would like to thank on behalf of this audience, the people of Root and Branch, I would like to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all that you do in the church. There are very few people of your seniority who would have had the courage to come and speak to us the way that you have and listened to us the way that you have today. And we want to bless you today for who you are and for all that you do. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Brian. And now it's over to Mary Ring for future events. Thank you, Brian. Time to just look ahead at our upcoming meetings and Peter, I think you'll pull up the slide <laughs> for me. Can I just say to everybody, all our future events will be found on our homepage. I don't know if you can see my little cursor, but the homepage is on the left, Root and Branch Synod. If you haven't yet, or you don't seem to be getting our events, please head to the bottom of any page. Looking on the right, the little pink box is found at the bottom of every single web page, and you simply make sure you fill that out in order that you get our newsletter and all our information. Thank you. So next slide, please, Peter. On the 1st of February, Dennis Jackson is kindly coming to us 
He works in a hospital for mental health where he's an ecumenical chaplain and he's going to describe to us how they meet uh, for Eucharist and in the community and we're hoping to um, extend this as an occasion for all of us to meet and talk together. We do a lot of listening as Root and Branch to our range of speakers to whom we're incredibly grateful but this will be an opportunity for all of us to break into little groups and to share our own experiences. So we're looking forward to that very much, thank you. And next one, please, Peter. Also in February, on the 23rd, same time, 20, um, 20 hundred hours London time, Thursday the 23rd, I am sure that many of us here tonight are passionately concerned for our common home. Everything that we've talked about tonight will evaporate if our earth is rent and destroyed. We're very grateful that Kathleen McLaughlin, um, who is chief executive of the Walmart Foundation, which is the philanthropical arm of Walmart, is a passionate supporter of Laudato Si. She's coming to talk about how you effect change from within. Um, and her foundation and faith are very strong in the face of this incredible challenge that we face. We will be following this up with further Laudato Si animators, we hope, coming to help us on March the 1st. So quite a lot to look forward to with Root and Branch, and thank you again all so much for coming this evening. Next slide, please, Peter. This slide of support and information Obviously, you can copy it quickly off the screen now if you want to, but we'll send it out after this talk, so it will be coming to every single email address that we do have. Thank you. This Peggy prayer has sustained us since we began as a little tiny root and branch group, and we find it very powerful. I wonder if three of us here, I've got the problem that I can't actually see you, but I wonder if three people in the visible screens could put up their hands so that Peter could choose us three people to read the first verse, the second short verse, and the third verse for us. It's a beautiful prayer, and we take great courage from it. Brian, please read, lead, lead us when you're ready. God's dream. I myself will dream a dream within you. Good dreams come from me, you know. My dreams seem impossible, not too practical, not for the cautious man or woman. A little risky sometimes, a, tight, a trifle brash perhaps. Some of my friends prefer to rest more comfortably in sounder sleep with visionless eyes. But from those who share my dreams, I ask a little patience, a little humour, some small courage and a listening heart. I will do the rest. Then they will risk and wonder at their daring, run, and marvel at their speed, build and stand in awe at the beauty of their building. You will meet me often as you work in your companions who share the risk, in your friends who believe in you enough to lend their own hands, their own hearts to your building, in the people who will stand in your doorway, stay a while and walk away knowing they too can find a dream. There will be sun-filled days, and sometimes it will rain, a little variety. Both come from me. So come now, be content. It is my dream you dream, my house you build, my caring you witness, my love you share. And this is the heart of the matter. Thank you everyone who's still with us and for those who've left and all the comments that you've made, which have been so helpful. And we just pray that some kind of change can take place, having been very grateful to Archbishop Sakuno for an incredible exposition of the, Be the Beatitudes. But what I like to pray is that the Beatitudes demand of us to be open to the grace of the Spirit. May the Spirit guide us all to very real change for a truly Beatitudinal and listening church. Goodbye, everybody, and see. We hope to see you again. And thank you once again to Archbishop Sakuna.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. God bless.